You had that massive catch, which I'm sure is going to be on your highlight for the rest of your life. You know, it, I mean, it was quite literally one of the craziest catches I've seen. The first thought after I tipped it was make sure the DB doesn't have a chance to catch it. So I was just really trying to focus on it all the way down to the ground. Here come the Irish. What a run! Touchdown! Play of the year for the Irish. Welcome back to the NB on NBC podcast. I'm your host, Corey Robinson. Week one did not go the way that Notre Dame fans wanted uh, a 21 to 10 loss at Ohio State in Columbus. I was there. It was rowdy. I, I, it was just the, the scene, the atmosphere was crazy. Over 106,000 people in attendance, all these NFL stars. LeBron James was there. Jason Tatum was there. It felt like that kind of, it was it felt like a constellation of uh, these stars just descending upon what really felt like a volcano. It, it, the noise was crazy. Um, I actually watched the whole game field side, which was or about three quarters of the game field side, which just, I'm telling you, ranked in my top five games ever as far as noise uh, is concerned. What we saw play out was Tyler Buckner's first career start. Uh, he actually became the first Chinese American to start uh, a quarterback for a power five team uh, on Saturday night in Columbus, which was, I think a pretty great debut for him in the first half. He actually at one point went eight for eight, um, had over a hundred yards and it looked like he was making good decisions, but what ended up being one of the things that, that made the difference in this game, in my personal opinion, was third down. The first half you saw Notre Dame and Ohio, and Ohio, Notre Dame and Ohio State basically kind of go neck and neck, and neck as far as third down conversion is concerned. And then the second half, that third down efficiency, Notre Dame stayed at three for th three the entire time. They ended up three for 13. They did not even convert a third down in the second half, whereas Ohio State uh, ended up with seven for 13. That mostly in my mind um, came late in the third quarter. And then the fourth quarter, it just, that momentum exploded and it was full steam ahead for Ohio State, could not stop them. Another thing I think was really interesting is the way that because um, we can't grade Tyler Buckner's first start without addressing the offensive line. The right side of the offensive line, Zeke Crow and Josh Lug really struggled, just quite frankly. And this then set up what was almost an impossible run game. How do you establish the run when you have half of an offensive line? Mind you, Jared Patterson was out with a right foot sprain. So Jared Patterson, captain, one of the people who has the DNA of this offensive line, which has been passed down from generation to generation to generation, all the way going back, at least in my mind, in recent memory, from you know Zach Martin to now Jared Patterson. You don't have that 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 link, that chain there. You're going to have a pretty interesting uh, result as far as a first time out as an offensive line. Andrew Kostrovic came in, did a great job, but the reality is, without that chain of the the DNA of the offensive line, I think it showed. How do you establish a run game? The answer is you get creative. Tommy Reese tried to get creative um, using a lot of like jet sweep motion, um, trying to get a, trying to get Tyler Buckner to do a lot of quarterback design runs. He ended up being the leading rusher, but the run game was never established. So in the first half, yes, Notre Dame was up 10-7. Yes, Ohio State was searching for answers. But offensively in the second half, what do you do? You, you go in the halftime, you make the adjustments, you come out and you realize, oh wait, um, Notre Dame can't do anything offensively except for quick game. And as far as like a defense is concerned, if you take away the quick game, then what do they have? They don't have a run game to make you, to keep you honest. And I think that really showed itself in the second half when Ohio State was able to pull away uh, and they were able to gain some momentum. Another thing I want to bring to your attention is Jackson Smith and Jigbo, who are one of the best receivers in the country, broke all these records in the Rose Bowl win for Ohio State. He ended up uh, leaving the game early due to injury. So that then added to the discombobulation that Ohio State experienced in that first half. It looked like they were confused, generally speaking. Um, and there was one moment in particular where right before the, the half ended, so Ohio State deferred, they were going to get the ball back in the second half. They were in the red zone with under a minute to play in, in the second quarter. It looked like they were going to score, then get the right ball right back and maybe score again. Talk about I mean, a 14-point swing. A timeout was called. They came out of the, the, the timeout. The receivers were in a bunch formation on the right side. They were still looking to the sideline, getting lined up. CJ Strauss snapped the ball. It took like a, like a second and a half or so for the receivers to realize the ball had been snapped. They ran the route combination, and it was an incomplete pass. And I thought to myself, that is not, 
that is not the number two team in the country as far as just mental acuity. You have to be on top of your game in that situation. This is a critical moment, and it was a comedy of errors. And then Notre Dame had another comedy of errors right after that and almost gave Ohio State the chance to correct that mistake or at least get on the board with, with a field goal. That is when I was like, okay, well, this game isn't very sharp. But the biggest takeaway for me was that Ohio State had to search for answers against uh, a number five ranked Notre Dame team. And I don't know if the number two team in the country, um, at least any of these top five matchups I've seen Notre Dame play in recent years, if they've ever had to search for answers against a Notre Dame team. So I think that's encouraging. But there needs to be better execution in the second half. Just It's as simple as that. But like I mentioned, I was out there in Columbus for this game day weekend of epic proportions. And this is what the atmosphere was like. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of fans um, coming from all over the country. Take a look. We're sitting outside of Ohio Stadium, our desired destination. We think the parachuters were around here. Maybe we can meet one. Don't want to promise anything. But around the corner is the Buckeye Grove. And that's one thing that I really circled because they plant a tree for every single All-American. And I think that's a great way to battle deforestation. And plus I like trees. So we're gonna go check it out. I come from a basketball family, and one thing that I think is really fun, me and my brothers do, everywhere we go in the world, we try to find a basketball court. We found one, and it's right here in front of Ohio Stadium. Could you imagine playing pickup right here? This would be sweet. But uh, I would say it ranks up there for me, probably top 15 as far as locations are concerned worldwide, which is, I feel like, pretty high. And I love doing what Tim Duncan used to do before every game. Go Spurs, go. So you might be curious, why are there X's over the M's? Uh, it, it's actually due to the Ohio State-Michigan rivalry. It's something that is just so <laughs> vivid on campus. The representation is so vivid that literally, this is we've seen this all over the place. M's, X'd over. When, this is Notre Dame. This is Notre Dame week. Not even Michigan's the last game this year, November 26th, well ahead of the game here. So here we are, Buckeye Grove. It's really nice because it's also next to all the athletic facilities, like the, all the rec center. That's the rec center right there. So all the tennis courts, the volleyball courts. It's like a nice vibe. Check it out. He was the first one they honored. You can't hear the athletic uh, competitions over. We just saw uh, uh, two people playing tennis, but you can't hear the cicadas. <laughs> They're everywhere. They're very loud. Uh, but every single tree has these really cool name tags of that show you who they honor. And every single spring, they plant that season, the past season's all American. as a nice tradition. People flocked from all over the country to see this game. We knew it was going to be a big thing, but I didn't understand just how big. Columbus for this game, a house divided. Go Irish. Oh, I O. Go Irish. Oh, I O. We ended up walking through student housing. The tailgates were rowdy. They had white tops up around all the houses, lawns full of students, to find ourselves here at Ohio Stadium, where we've met Notre Dame fans who came all the way from Kentucky, Notre Dame fans who came all the way from Dallas. In the hotel on the way over here, I met a Ohio, an Ohio State fan who had a red luchador mask on, an Ohio State chain, and he said he came all the way from Vegas. So talk about a big matchup. Wow. And we just saw the team come in. This time, security has been increased. So the amount of fans just waiting to get a glimpse of their favorite players, walking steps away. Everything's right here, and it's happened. It's crazy. The idea that this is kind of like a mecca for football, it holds, it holds true. People coming all over, the, all over the country to just see a game here at Ohio Stadium. And quite frankly, it lives up to the hype. So game day at Ohio State was unlike anything I've ever experienced, largely because of, it was a top five matchup. The, the stadium was like a raging volcano. This is field side of Ohio Stadium, 100th anniversary. This is a top, top matchup, top five. Two of the most successful programs in the history of college football. Only met seven times. This is number seven right now. First time in the regular season since 19, 
96. So if you're asking me, a sports fan, how's it feel to watch Notre Dame, Ohio State, at Ohio State? Priceless. I don't know if he knows I'm a Notre Dame fan. I was expecting much more hatred. Turned out there was a lot more congeniality. Um, but the fans were magnificent. The skull session was crazy. Um, that game itself ebbed and flowed, but the second half was prob probably one of the loudest arenas I've ever been in. Uh, it was so loud, it was just shaking, um, at least my eardrums. So that final scoreline of 21 to 10, it was disappointing, but it was truly an unbeatable experience. Yeah, it's, that, that was going to be something that I'm going to just put in my memory bank as uh, one of the most unforgettable and special experiences of my life. And I don't understand how a lot of stuff happened. It kind of just, it was a miraculous unfolding for me and my producer, Morgan. Thank you so much for all your help, Morgan. It, it was an amazing trip. I got the chance to talk to Matt Salerno, one of the, the, uh, one of the heroes for Notre Dame in this game. He had this falling catch which will go down. I mean, it's going to be on his highlight reel for the rest of his life. It was an amazing catch. He got the chance um, to tell me about it, which you don't always you don't always get. So I was counting my lucky stars. Here's my conversation with Matt Salerno. I am thrilled to be joined by graduate senior Matt Salerno for the Indy on NBC podcast. Matt, uh, you just got done with practice, right? It went a little long today. How did practice go coming back from an Ohio State uh, loss on the road? Uh, it was a good practice. We actually practiced uh, yesterday, so we were able to get some of those corrections in, um, you know, kind of flush it out of our system and then, you know, work today solely on Marshall. So um, it was good practice. You, you practice on a, on a Monday? Really? Well, it's a long story. We had some troubles getting home with the plane, so uh, the schedule got all mixed up. But, yeah, we had a really short, just, you know, like helmets only um, run through some stuff. What happened with the travel day? Because I saw you guys go on to the bus pretty late, and I knew you guys were going to get back, I think, like 2 or 3 in the morning, and I was thinking, man, that's, that's rough as far as recovery is concerned. Yeah, I'm not sure the, all the details, but I think the there was an issue with the plane, so we had to stay a little longer at the hotel, and we ended up getting back later than expected, so um, kind of moved the schedule around. What time did you guys arrive? Uh, back in South Bend. Yeah. Like 9 in the morning, I think. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Did you, yeah, go, did you go straight to the the training room just get treatment? Like what? <laughs> um, I think we had like a couple hours off, and then treatment started at like three or something. So it was just a nightmare. But um, you know, we worked through it. Wow. Yeah, I, I was actually at the game in Columbus, and you had that massive catch, which I'm sure is going to be on your highlight for the rest of your life. You know, it, I mean, it was quite literally one of the craziest catches I've seen. Um, you were in that moment. When you saw the ball coming and you were falling, what was going through your mind? Um, I mean, the first thought after I tipped it was make sure the DB doesn't have a chance to catch it. So I was just really trying to focus on it all the way down to the ground. Um, and, you know, I was fortunate enough it was stayed close enough to my body and off the ground that I was able to finish the catch. Were you the primary receiver, receiver on that on that uh, route combo? Uh, I'm not sure what the quarterback's progression is on it, but I had a you know, big box fade from the slot versus press coverage. So it was a really good look for it. Um, and, you know, Tyler took the shot. So. So when you, when you think about um, the offense performance and that, that first game, what were the big takeaways for you? And what does the, the offense need to improve on this week versus Marshall? Um, I think it's just a lot of little details that we need to clean up. Um, and just, you know, of course, executing in the fourth quarter. Um, a lot of things we went into the game with planned out worked really well. Um, and, you know, some things were just, you know, one or two players or a couple inches off. So I think just cleaning up really little details and then, um, you know, really perfecting what we want to do going into Marshall will be good for us. When you were watching the tape on this Marshall team, you know, just, just for people watching and listening, Marshall put up 55 points and they held Norfolk State to three, right? So when you think about this high-powered offense uh, that you're going to have to compete against, um, it seems like there's going to be a lot of pressure on you guys. When you're watching that defense, what jumps out? What are the opportunities where you guys can take advantage of them? Um, you know, I think uh, we have a lot of speed and um, skill on the outside and the perimeter. So I think just taking advantage of those matchups, um, you know, taking shots down the field and, um, you know, just executing when we need to on the big plays will be big for us versus Marshall. I want to ask you, Matt, about um, just more personal stuff. You got a scholarship this year. Congratulations. And uh, I remember when 
what one of my friends was a walk on who got a scholarship when I was playing. It was a huge deal. And they actually announced it in front of the whole team. We all went crazy. Uh, what was that process like for you when, when you heard uh, back in January? Um, well, there wasn't really an announcement for me. Uh, I was kind of just phone calls with Coach Freeman and Coach Reese while I was back at home for our break after the Oklahoma State game. Um, so we kind of got got that worked out. It wasn't really anything public. And then I think just through word of mouth, kind of through the building, the, the word kind of got out slowly. So there wasn't really some huge reveal or big moment. But um, at least for me, you know, when Coach Freeman gave me the call when I was at home, it, it, was, it was a really great moment. What was that the, the first reaction for you when, when you got that phone call? Um, I mean, just extremely grateful. Uh, it was, you know, a big decision for me to come back. Uh, of course, I, I probably wouldn't have been able to come back if I wasn't on scholarship, um, just because it's obviously so expensive to go to school at Notre Dame. So I was just, you know, extremely grateful, especially being a lifelong Notre Dame fan, having the opportunity to play one more year at Notre Dame. It was just a huge deal for me. And to have you know a crazy catch in a top five matchup that's going to be I mean it's going to live for a long time, Matt. <laughs> so when you, yeah. So when you talk to your family about that, when when they're going to do like highlight clips of Notre Dame football, to think that you might be on that as a fan, I mean, <laughs> what was that like talking to your family? Like just like how do you process that? I mean, I'm still processing it. Honestly, it's a, just a crazy experience. Um, I got to see my family was at the game, so I got to see them right after and. Um, you know, just see how happy they were and proud they were. It was just a big moment for, for myself and my entire family because um, Notre Dame's been a big part of our lives forever. So, What, what did your parents tell you after the game? Um, just they're happy for me, proud of me, um, especially that it was, you know, such a big environment that they were able to watch me do that after, you know, being at Notre Dame for so long and um, not really seeing the fruits of that work I've been putting in. Um, so it was just a big moment. You you played in a lot of big games. You've seen a lot of big games. Uh, where does that Ohio State just atmosphere rank for you? Just just briefly before we move on to Marshall. Um, of course, pretty high. I think probably my top three would be Ohio State, Virginia Tech, and Florida State. Um, just super loud crowds, huge environments, um, and I, I just love those games. We practice all week with the crowd noise, and when you get there, it's just so loud. And I just I love environments like that. Home opener. First one in the Marcus Freeman era. You mm -hmm. know how crazy Notre Dame Stadium can get. And, and I, so when you think about this home opener for you, what do you think the fan reaction will be for, you know, for, for Marcus Freeman's first home game? I think it'll be a, a really positive reaction. I know people are really excited about Coach Freeman. Um, even though we didn't get the result we wanted last week, I think people are still pleased with a lot of stuff that they saw. And obviously we proved that we're a top team in the country and compete with some of the best teams. Um, so I think people will be excited for us to come out versus Marshall and see Coach Freeman in that stadium for the first time as head coach. As far as the team's preparation is concerned, you know, the first game being on the road, now getting back into your own, like, schedule at home where you're not, like, having to deal with the, you know, the hotels on the road and stuff. Uh, how do you think that will affect the team's preparation the heading into the, the home game? Um, I don't think it will affect us too much. You know, um, we've got a lot of veterans on the team. We're used to going away, staying home, um, and our preparation stays the same. I mean, the schedule is always a little bit different, but I think guys are just used to preparing for different environments. And, um, you know, home or away, we try and prepare the same way. So now I, I want to ask you about uh, campus life, because, you know, this is Indy on NBC podcast. This isn't the NFL, right? So we're not going to talk about ball. Um, what, what class are you taking this year as, as a graduate senior? Um, so I'm doing a, a master's program in computer science. Um, so I have four classes. I think it's uh, systems programming, data structures, um, operating systems, and computing-based entrepreneurship. Um, so those are my four classes. I'm hoping to graduate in May, um, but it's it's different than a lot of other schools for sure. So when you, I mean, <laughs> to do a master's program in computer science and then go make this 31-yard catch at Ohio State, I mean, it's like, how, how do you balance studying like, you know, programming or coding and co computer-based entrepreneurship with your you know, ambitions on the field to go win a national championship? Like, what does that on the day-to-day -day look like? Um, well, it's obviously a huge time commitment, but on the other hand, it's also, it's helpful that, you know, we work so hard at football and then when it's time to take a break, I can switch gears and completely forget about that and work on something different. And then when school is getting too much, I can come out on the field and, you know, just refresh and reset. So 
it's obviously difficult and time consuming, but on the other hand, there's there's also some some positive aspects to it. I remember I was a like a like a re, program of liberal studies major. We read a lot of books and like you know I remember studying like opera and stuff, and I was surprised to see how like you know when I was studying ballet and opera, like how that affected my my game as a receiver because I would just pull things that I never even knew. I was like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. I wonder if I could try that in football. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had that experience? Maybe like just like conversations with your computer science, you know, like fellow computer science classmates be like, huh, I wonder if I can apply this to football. Um, not that I can think about <laughs> maybe sometime in there, but not that I can think of. Gotcha. Today is worth a shot. So, so where, uh, where are you living these days and, and what dorm was your first dorm on, on Notre Dame? Just so we can get that Notre Dame intro for everyone watching. So I live off campus now. I live in Irish Row, which is um, just like a three minute walk from the football building. But my first dorm was Dillon Hall, um, which I'm very proud of. And all my my closest friends are from Dillon Hall. Um, so, yeah, go Big Red. Uh, what, what's your favorite tradition from Dillon before we, we wrap this up? Um, probably Stash Bash. Just uh, the we have like a little bowling party and everyone grows out their stashes. and. <laughs> It just looks so bad, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> well, Matt, I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for making the time to talk to us. It's a pleasure to talk to you, and we hope to see more big catches from you and more uh, great production from you this season. Thank you. Of course. Thank you so much. Make NBC Sports Predictor a pregame ritual every week. Play Irish Pick'em for free and have a chance to win $10,000 each week. Rush the end zone and download NBC Sports Predictor app today on the App Store and Google Play Store. Thank you very much, Matt. I can't believe that, I mean, computer science classes, top five matchups in Ohio State, <laughs> winning a scholarship. I mean, what, what a year it's been for Mr. Salerno. Uh, up next, we have the home opener. This is going to be really exciting. Marshall. Marshall just uh, has, they had 380 yards rushing this past game against Norfolk State. And I understand Norfolk State is, a, is an FCS opponent. But what is important to note here is 380 yards is a lot of yards. <laughs> like, that's a lot of yards. And this is all without uh, Rasheen Ali, who was actually tied in the FBS as far as touchdowns. 23. He, he led um, him and, and the running back from BYU, led the FBS in rushing touchdowns, had over 1,400 yards. He wasn't playing. You know, he has a, he has a leave of absence from the team right now. So, Ethan Payne and Kalan Laybourne have stepped up big for this Marshall team. Both of them had over 100 yards rushing. And the quarterback, Henry Columbia, is a transfer from Texas Tech. All this to say, Notre Dame doesn't necessarily have a walk in the park in the, in the sense that you might think, okay, well, coming off of this Ohio State game, there were some great, great things that we can take away from as Notre Dame fans. Uh, perhaps the national championship hopes or the college football hopes might have been dimmed a bit, but... We're going to come back strong with this game against Marshall. I think that's a completely fair assessment. But you have to realize on the schedule, this is one of two TV games scheduled for Marshall. We were always told when we were playing football at Notre Dame. This is every time they play you, the other team, it doesn't matter how big or how small, this is their Super Bowl. But especially for smaller schools, because um, you just don't get the chance to play on national television that often. So keep that in mind when Marshall comes to town. I think my mind will go straight to that offensive line. Can Notre Dame establish a run? Um, they weren't able to do that against Ohio State. That's going to be extremely important just for the psyche, the confidence of that offensive line. And can Tyler Buckner continue to build confidence? Because I think he should be feeling very confident right now as a sophomore quarterback uh, from that performance where he didn't turn the ball over. Uh, I know the, the, the third down efficiency stalled in the second half. But all in all, he didn't really make a lot of mistakes. Um, that should be encouraging. Can he build on that confidence? The defense, I think the front seven did a great job that first half against Ohio State. Can they do that for four quarters, particularly against a, a really strong rushing opponent? That's going to be huge for this Notre Dame defense. And then, of course, talk about the fanfare. I mean, this is the Freeman era, a first home game. Can we just take a moment to soak in the sunshine back in Notre Dame Stadium? That, those are the things I'll be looking for. We'll be back next week with reactions to this game, this home opener, and look ahead to that Irish's next game in South Bend versus Cal. Be sure to download and subscribe to the Notre Dame on NBC podcast on the NBC Sports YouTube channel and wherever you get your audio podcast. Go Irish.